Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. I'd also like to say something a little bit different at the start of this lecture, because as many of you know, we lost our dear clerk, Harry Evans, this week. And I'd like to dedicate this, um, this occasion to his memory. And I'm sure that those of you who've been coming to, men for, to these lectures for many years will, will appreciate that. And uh, in fact, it was 25 years ago this year that we had the first occasional lectures. They were very occasional then, and now we have regular occasional lectures. And we greatly appreciate your patronage in coming along to support them. Now, I have to say that we planned this lecture months and months ago, and nobody could foresee its great relevance to events of today. We planned to um, invite Dr. Brendan Nelson to give a historical perspective on a very large and important issue in our democracy, and that is the role of the elected representatives in decisions for Australia to go to war. Um, Dr Nelson is obviously someone who doesn't need an introduction. I, I know that, that one says this about various people, but Dr Brendan Nelson is so eminently qualified to give us his views on this topic today. He's currently the director of the Australian War Memorial, and you will know that in Burley Griffin's design, the central axis of Canberra connects this building right down the middle of Anzac Parade to the War Memorial, two incredibly iconic places um, which celebrate different parts of our national institution and our national character. Dr Nelson is, is a medical doctor originally. He was uh, national president of, of the AMA. And it was those days that I first remember seeing him here in Parliament House. He then went on to become uh, a member of, of Parliament, of course, the Defence Minister, hugely significant portfolio, and, uh, and leader of the opposition. And now he's doing some wonderful things over at the War Memorial and also in his role as a distinguished visiting fellow at the ANU and a member of the Board of Presidents for the US National World War II Museum. So I'd like you to welcome or join me in welcoming Dr Brendan Nelson to speak to us today about the role of the Australian Parliament when going to war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, thank you for your very generous introduction and also for the invitation which was extended to me in February this year. Uh, to deliver this occasional address on this topic, uh, the role of government and of the parliament in the decision to go to war. Uh, I too would like to very much to associate myself uh, with the remarkable life and service of uh, Harry Evans, uh, clerk of the Senate, a fearless uh, advocate for senatorial process and at times, uh, shall I say, an irritant uh, for governments of both so persuasions in the House of Representatives. But, by any standard, a man who made a difference to our nation uh, with his life. And amongst many of you I see before me today, there is uh, another, uh, and I recognise John Kerrin, a uh, remarkably decent, uh, hardworking and effective uh, representative for our nation, a former minister uh, from the opposite side of politics uh, from myself. Uh, but uh, some people rise above all of that, and in my opinion, John very much was and remains one of them. I recognise too the traditional Indigenous uh, owners of the land upon which our parliament here in Australia has been built. I'm about to do something that I have not done for a very long period of time. There is one thing that I do not like, and that's people reading speeches to me. And there's only one thing I dislike more, and that's actually reading one to other people. But I have actually written this speech, and I will now read it to you. Uh, it will cover much of Australia's history and in doing so it will inform, I would like to think, who we are now and some of the decisions that perhaps we will continue to need to make in the future. Private Jake 
Covco, age 33. Captain Mark Bingley, age 35. SAS Trooper Josh Porter, age 28. Trooper David Poppy Pierce, age 41. SAS Sergeant Matthew Locke, age 33. Private Luke Worsley, age 26. SAS Signaller Sean McCarthy, age 25. Lance Corporal Jason Marks, age 27. These eight men died as a direct result of decisions that I made, supported or administered during my tenure as Australia's Minister for Defence. For me, those at a ministerial level with whom I served, those ministers who came before me, and for those that have followed, the issues that we are about to explore are anything but academic hypotheticals. They are real. They are very real. Those decisions carried most heavily by Prime Ministers are also ones from which enemy combatants will be killed. They, like Australia's own defence personnel, have families who love them and give meaning to their lives, whatever the misguided, distorted and perverse nature of their cause. When Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II visited Australia in October 2011, I was watching the news broadcast of her visit to Canberra in my Brussels office on BBC World News. The British journalist concluded his package on the front steps of Parliament House. Looking down Anzac Parade, he said, there is something that Australians have right. Looking from the seat of government here in the direct line of sight is the Australian War Memorial. It reminds Australia's politicians that some of their decisions come at a very high price. The Australian War Memorial was the vision of Charles Bean, Australia's official First World War historian. Bean had landed with the troops at Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1915, and he stayed with them at the front through to the very end of the war. It was at Pozier, France, in the depths of the bloody fighting of 1916, where Australia had sustained 23 casualties in six weeks, that in late July Bean recorded the following in his diary. Many a man lying out there at Pozier and in the low scrub of Gallipoli, with his poor, tired senses barely working through the fever of his brain, has thought in his last moments, well, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. A mortally wounded Australian later asked of Bean, will they remember me in Australia? And so it was in discussion with others that Bean resolved that at the war's end, he would build the finest memorial and museum to the men of the AIF and the nurses. He returned to Australia to convince the government to pass an act to give effect to his idea. The men fighting and dying in France, Belgium and Sinai, Palestine would know that at war's end, they would be remembered. The political capital of our nation resides within this, our national parliament but the War Memorial is custodian of its soul. The visiting chief of the Turkish Air Force last year pointed to one of the names in bronze where Australians have fought and died over 100 years and asked, why were Australians there? I replied, General, that is a very important question. In answering it, your journey of discovery will lead you to an understanding of who we are and what makes us tick as Australians. Our destiny as a people is determined not so much by the economic indices with which we are perhaps so understandably obsessed, but our values and our beliefs, the way we relate to one another and see our place in the world. We are defined as a people most by our heroes and our villains, our triumphs and failures, the way in which as a people we have faced the adversities before us. Federation in 1901 was the culmination of more than a generation of debate amongst our forebears in the colonies as to whether we wanted to be governed as one. But beyond the nation's rich indigenous history, pioneering efforts of those who came on the first fleet and the immigrants who would join them in the 19th century 
we were yet to have our story. The cataclysm that unfolded from late 1914 changed us. Formation of the Australian Imperial Forces, overseas deployment of Australians in an Australian uniform, with an Australian flag, and all that would follow, militarily and in parallel with the deep divisions that emerged domestically, gave birth to our greater sense of who we are. Every nation has its own story. This is ours. Much of it is embedded in the service and sacrifice of two million men and women who have worn and who now wear the uniform of the Royal Australian Navy, Army and Royal Australian Air Force. So too, the decisions that governments have made to deploy those uniformed Australians are integral to that story. Perhaps the two most significant powers vested in government are to deny freedom of its citizens and to deploy its defence forces for war. Since Federation, neither the Australian Constitution nor defence legislation has required the government to gain parliamentary approval to deploy forces overseas, nor in the rare cases that it has occurred has the government had to consult parliament in its decision to declare war. It would be reasonable to expect that this would be explicitly stated in our Australian Constitution. Section 51 of the Constitution empowers the Australian Parliament to pass laws in relation to naval and military defence. Section 68 entrusts the Governor-General as representative of the monarch with the Commander-in-Chief of Australian Forces, although in practice this is purely titular. There's no explicit statement in the Constitution setting out specifically who should commit Australia to war. Paradoxically, perhaps, the answer does lie in the Constitution. Finding it requires the context of understanding that our Constitution is a document that was framed in the 19th century, according to British conventions and practices. For centuries in Britain, the power to declare war was one of the royal prerogatives, entirely a matter for the Crown. Under the Australian Constitution, former royal prerogatives, including the power to make war, deploy troops and declare peace, are part of the executive power of the Commonwealth. Executive power is recognised in section 61 of the Constitution. It vests executive power in the Queen and permits its exercise by the Governor-General on the Queen's behalf. The Governor-General, of course, acts on the advice of ministers in accordance with the principle of responsible government. That principle is at the very heart of British and Australian constitutional arrangements. It is one which requires the Crown to act on the advice of ministers who are in turn members of and responsible to the Parliament. Contemporary practice is that decisions to go to war are ultimately matters for the Prime Minister and Cabinet involving directly neither the Governor-General nor the Federal Executive Council. Although the government is not legally required to consult Parliament, when declaring war or deploying forces overseas, on most occasions the Prime Minister or Defence Minister has informed Parliament of Cabinet's decision through a ministerial statement or tabled papers. This invariably is followed by debate and vote on a motion. The newly elected Howard Government established the National Security Committee, NSC, in 1996, a committee of cabinet. This body has since assumed preeminence in the decision-making process. It is the NSC that considers, debates and resolves to commit Australian defence personnel to domestic or overseas deployments. The full cabinet then considers the advice and recommendation of the NSC. Once a position is adopted, the opposition leader, members of the full government, executive and its backbench are briefed. Since 1985, the Australian Democrats firstly, and more recently the Australian Greens, have attempted to remove the exclusive power of the government to commit Australia to war. Attempts have been made to repeal Section 50C of the Defence Act 1903 
which allows the deployment of Australian troops overseas, replacing it with a requirement for both Houses of Parliament to approve a declaration of war and commitment of troops. While the power to make war, deploy troops and declare peace are essential elements of the executive power of the Commonwealth, it is open to any government to put such matters to the Parliament for debate. The Hawke government did just this in January 1991. Both Canada and New Zealand have similar constitutional arrangements to Australia. The Clark Labor government offered to supply New Zealand SAS troops to the United States within days of the attacks on 11 September 2001. The decision was not referred to the Parliament until the 3rd of October. Prime Minister Clark emphasised that although the government did not need the approval of Parliament, she brought the matter to a vote because she, and I quote, wanted the troops to know that they had the full support of MPs. Although the legal position in the United Kingdom remains unchanged from that of royal prerogative excisable by ministers, exercisable by ministers, it is standard practice for governments to keep Parliament well informed of decisions to use force and the progress of campaigns. Since 2003, and Britain joining the coalition that would forcibly topple Saddam Hussein, there have been calls for the royal prerogative, including the monarch's war powers, to be codified and subject to parliamentary scrutiny. A precedent for military action being subject to parliamentary approval was set in 2013. The Cameron government sought in principle support from the House of Commons for the United Kingdom military action against the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad. The government motion was defeated. Prime Minister Cameron, speaking in the House, subsequently ruled out any involvement by the United Kingdom in military action against Syria. When opposition leader Edward Miliband asked by point of order for the Prime Minister rule out use of any of the royal prerogative for the UK to enjoin any military action before another vote in the House of Commons, Prime Minister Cameron responded by this. I can give the assurance. Let me say, he said, that the House has not voted for either motion tonight. I strongly believe in the need for a tough response to the use of chemical weapons, but I also believe in respecting the will of this House of Commons. It is very clear tonight that, while the House has not passed a motion, the British Parliament, reflecting the views of the British people, does not want to see British military action. I get that, and the government will act accordingly. End of quote. The Constitution of the United States grants to Congress the power to declare war, to raise and support armies and to provide and maintain a navy. The President is made the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. The War Powers Resolution 1973, or the War Powers Act as it's described colloquially, provides for the President to consult, report and terminate deployment of armed forces with the approval of Congress. Presidents haven't always followed this act. Courts have failed to uphold it and its legality. The US Supreme Court especially has been reluctant to take on cases which deal with it, regarding it as a political rather than a judicial issue. In fact, in 2003, the District Court's Judge Toro rejected the contention that the President must have congressional authority to order American forces into combat. He concluded, and I quote, case law makes clear that the Congress does not have the exclusive right to determine whether or not the United States engages in war. This decision was upheld in an appeal later that year to the first US Circuit Court of Appeals. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, arising from the Washington Declaration of 1949 has two essential articles which govern its founding principle of mutual self-defence. On the 12th of September 2001, NATO invoked Article 5 for the first and only time in its history in response to the attacks on the United States the day before. Article 5 provides for individual and mutual self-defence and is consistent with Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations. 
Going back in our own history, firstly to the First World War, it was a combination of diplomatic miscalculations, brinkmanship and bluff by statesmen and military leaders gradually that escalated a minor conflict in the Balkans into a large-scale European war. Any opportunity for mediation was lost when on the 28th of July 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Russia mobilised against Germany and Austria-Hungary the following day. Germany mobilised its armies on the 31st of July and on the 3rd of August it commenced its invasion of Belgium so that it could attack Russia's ally, France. At 11pm on the 4th of August 1914, English time, the British Cabinet of Prime Minister Herbert Asquith declared war on Germany as a consequence of its invasion of neutral Belgium and France and of Germany's failure to respond to the ultimatum by Britain for it to withdraw its forces. Although Britain was the only major power to debate in Parliament its entry into the war, the British government did not consult Australia or any of the other dominions and colonies about its decision to declare war. Legally, as part of the British Empire, Australia was at war immediately upon the British government's declaration of war. Modern day assertions, which we hear frequently, that Australia was fighting other people's wars, reflects a failure to understand the nature of the British Empire at the time and how Australians regarded their own nation. They saw themselves as Australian Britons and cherished their ties to the empire through almost every thread of society. No doubt Indigenous Australians had a different perspective. In July 1914, Australia was in the midst of a double dissolution election campaign. The Liberal Party, led by Prime Minister Joseph Cook, was seeking to remove the Labor Party Senate majority, which was frustrating the government's agenda, if that sounds familiar. Andrew Fisher, leader of the Labor opposition, announced to an election meeting in Colac, Victoria on the 31st of July that Australia should stand beside Britain and defend her to our last man and our last shilling. Prime Minister Cook later told a campaign gathering in Horsham that all our resources in Australia are in the empire and for the empire and for the preservation and security of the empire. The Governor-General, Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson, had adopted uh, an interventionist uh, posture in relation to his role, and that same day he sent a telegram to Prime Minister Cook asking this, would it not be well, in view of the latest news from Europe, that ministers should meet in order that the Imperial Government may know what support to expect from Australia? Four days later, on the 3rd of August, Cook convened his cabinet in Melbourne and subsequently advised the British government that if Britain went to war, Australia would place the Royal Australian Navy vessels under British Admiralty control and send a land force of 20,000 men of, and I quote, any suggested composition to any destination desired by the home government, end of quote. The parliament did not sit until the 8th of October. There was no ministerial statement to parliament. The governor general in his opening address said this, you have been called together at the earliest moment after the return of the Ritz to deal with matters of great national importance, many of them arising out of the calamitous war in the empire which has compelled to, to engage. It has been necessary to anticipate parliamentary approval of expenditure urgently required for war purposes. A bill covering all such unauthorised expenditure will be submitted for your consideration at the earliest possible moment. The motion was moved that the address be agreed to by the House and it was resolved in the affirmative without division. In September 1939, the Australian government didn't consider it had a choice over whether or not to go to war against Germany. Prime Minister Robert Menzies simply declared that since Britain was at war, so too was Australia. And so from the 3rd of September, a state of war existed between the Commonwealth of Australia and Germany. The only formal act was a notice in the Gazette requesting the British government inform the German government that Australia would be associated with the Britain in the war. Parliament met on the 6th of September 1939 and Prime Minister Menzies tabled a white paper and delivered a ministerial statement on the war in Europe. The paper contained the text of documents exchanged between Britain and Germany. The motion that the paper be printed was debated in both houses. In his statement, Menzies said, 
However long this conflict may last, I do not seek a muzzled opposition. Our institutions of parliament and of liberal thought, free speech and free criticism must go on. In his response, opposition leader John Curtin expressed disappointment that Menzies had not outlined the intentions of the government in respect of the defence of this Commonwealth and of the general principles upon which it proposed to be influenced in framing its program. Curtin added a statement endorsed by his Labor caucus demanding that to provide maximum protection of the democratic rights of Australians, it is essential that the Parliament of the Commonwealth should remain in session. Debate in the House was adjourned. The motion was passed in the Senate on the voices without division. In December 1941, Prime Minister John Curtin's Labor government pursued a constitutional innovation whereby Australia made a declaration of war independent of Britain. While the declaration of war on Bulgaria in January 1942, or with it, the Australian government implied that a British dominion could remain neutral even if a state of war existed between Britain and another nation. The United Nations Security Council resolutions in relation to Korea were approved on 25 and 27 June 1950. They had recommended that members of the United Nations furnish such assistance to the Republic of Korea as may be necessary to repel the armed attack and to restore international peace and security in the area. Having already placed an Australian naval force at the disposal of the United States authorities on behalf of the Security Council, and similarly the Royal Australian Air Force Fighter Squadron uh, stationed in Japan, Prime Minister Robert Menzies delivered a statement to the Parliament on the 6th of July 1950. Ben Chifley, Leader of the Opposition, supported the motion, there being no division in either House. The commitment of Australian forces to the conflict in Vietnam was a gradual process of escalation in the context of the Cold War concern over regional security and communist expansion. As Cold War tensions escalated during the 1960s, the Vietnam conflict assumed disproportionate strategic influence. Vietnam became the focal point for a supreme struggle between the communist bloc, the United States and allied nations. Australia's gradual military involvement in South Vietnam was based less on ideology than on two pragmatic principles. First, the government sent forces to support the emergent independent state of South Vietnam to frustrate communist expansion through aggression and subversion in Southeast Asia. The domino theory was evoked. Second, by supporting the United States and Vietnam, Australia was held to be paying the premium on an insurance policy. The Australian government sought both to maintain a strong American presence in Southeast Asia and to ensure American support of Australia's own security. On the 24th of May 1962, the Minister for Defence, Athel Townley, issued a press release announcing that Australia was sending a group of military instructors to South Vietnam in response to a request from its government. There was no statement to Parliament. Three years later, on the 29th of April 1965, Prime Minister Robert Menzies noted that in a ministerial statement on foreign affairs on the 23rd of March, a month earlier, the Minister for External Affairs had, and I quote, devoted a large part of his statement to Vietnam. Menzies advised the House that the request had been received from the government of South Vietnam for further military assistance. In response, the government had decided in principle some time ago that it would be willing to do so if such a request had come. A positive response was regarded as necessary for collaboration with the United States. In response, the Leader of the Opposition, Arthur Corwell, said in part, we oppose the government's decision to send 800 men to fight in Vietnam. We oppose it firmly and completely. The House divided along party lines. The ensuing five years would see early, overwhelming public support for the war and Australia's involvement in it transform into that of a deeply, deeply divided nation. Opposition to the war and conscription of young Australians 
sadly extended in part to political attacks on Australia's military personnel. The latter is not a mistake the nation will make again. When the president of the Ba'athist Iraq, Saddam Hussein, sanctioned an invasion of Kuwait on the 2nd of August, 1990, global condemnation ensued. The United Nations Security Council moved quickly to approve a trade embargo against Iraq. A large US-led multinational task force was assembled to block Iraq's access to the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman to ensure the tobago, embargo. The UN Security Council set a deadline for Iraqi forces to withdraw from Kuwait by the 15th of January, 1991. When this was not met, the 40,000 troops from 30 countries assembled in Saudi Arabia launched air attacks on Iraqi targets. Prime Minister Bob Hawke announced on the 10th of August, 1990, Cabinet's decision that day to commit Australia Australia would deploy naval ships in support of the blockade and later a small number of intelligence and medical personnel. Prime Minister Hawke was keen to inform Parliament and for it to sign on, my words, sign on to the government's decision. On the 21st of August 1990, in a ministerial statement to the House, Bob Hawke said, and I quote, I want to take this first opportunity available to me to inform the House of the view the government has taken of the situation which has arisen in the Middle East over the past three weeks and of the measures we have adopted to meet that situation. The statement was supported by the John Hewson led opposition. The emotion was agreed without division. On the 4th of December, Prime Minister Hawke delivered a ministerial statement on the Gulf crisis. In it, he expressed strong support for the United Nations Security Council Resolution 678 drawing attention to its request for all nations to provide appropriate support for actions taken under it. Parliament was specifically recalled on the 21st of January, 1991, to specifically debate the Gulf War, whilst refusing to allow questions of him or of ministers in the House, Prime Minister Hawke said this, the decision to commit Australian armed forces to combat is of course one that constitutionally is the prerogative of the executive. It is fitting, however, that I place on parliamentary record the train of events behind this decision. The motion moved by the Prime Minister was strongly supported by the opposition. It sought support for the United Nations and Resolution 678, but it also expressed its full confidence in and support for Australian forces serving with the UN sanctioned multinational forces in the Gulf. At least one lesson had been learned from Vietnam. On the 11th of September 2001, four civilian airlines were hijacked and used as weapons against targets in New York and Washington DC, principally the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Almost 3,000 innocent civilians, including 10 Australians, were murdered that day. These heinous events had been planned and executed by Al Qaeda led by Osama bin Laden working from Afghanistan. It was the culmination of similar, smaller scale terrorist attacks against mainly US interests over a decade. Prime Minister John Howard was in Washington when the attacks occurred. He was witness to the terror, fear, chaos, immediate consequences and response. He announced his intention at a press conference in the afternoon of the 12th of September to support a US military response, even though no request had been made. He later acknowledged that this commitment was made without consultation, but in the belief that he would have the support of cabinet, the opposition leader and the Australian people, as recorded by Karen Middleton in her book, The Unwinnable War. The National Security Committee first met on the 12th of September in Canberra, chaired by John Anderson as Acting Prime Minister. John Howard spoke to Alexander Downer, Foreign Minister, on the 13th of September by phone from Air Force Two en route to Hawaii to discuss Australia's response. In outlining US thinking, Howard stated that retaliation was, and I quote, virtually inevitable. NATO invoked its Article 5 Mutual Defence Clause that day in support of the United States. Invoking ANZUS as justification 
was raised by Downer with Howard during his phone call pursuant to an earlier discussion with Australia's Ambassador to the United States, Michael Forley. Cabinet endorsed invoking ANZUS on the 14th of September with Howard back in Australia. Opposition leader Kim Beasley supported it. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 1373 passed on the 28th of September and it denounced the 9-11 attacks and affirmed the collective right of self-defence with the use of all means to combat threats by terrorists. Prime Minister Howard announced Cabinet's decision for a military commitment and deployment on the 4th of October, the first parliamentary sitting day after the 9-11 attacks was 17 September. Routine business was su suspended in both houses. The same motion was introduced into both houses and beyond condolences, it also proposed that 9-11 constituted an attack against the United States within the meaning of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. As such, Australia was committed to support US-led action against those responsible. Although there was no dissent, some called for a tolerant, measured, discriminate and just response. Some Democrats and Green Senators supported a change to the motion away from what they regarded as an open-ended military commitment to the United States. On the 25th of September 2011, The Age newspaper reported a poll in which 77% of Australians supported the US-led war against terrorism. The United States was in no mood for appeasement after the September 11 attacks. Indeed, protection of the United States, its homeland, people, interests, and values was foremost in the thinking of its political class and leadership. In its simplest form, who and what represented the next possible significant threat? The regime of Saddam Hussein had used chemical and biological weapons against Iranian and Kurdish civilians both during and after the Iran-Iraq War of 1980-88. It had also pursued an extensive biological and nuclear weapons program throughout the 1980s. In 1988, faced with diminishing Iraqi cooperation, the United States had called for the withdrawal of all UN weapons inspectors. This was despite its belief that Iraq still possessed large hidden stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction and that Hussein was trying to procure more. By 2003, in the post 9-11 world, the United States was also of the belief that Hussein was harbouring and supporting Al Qaeda. Passed in November 2002, UN Resolution 1441 outlined breaches by Saddam Hussein of a succession of UN resolutions. Among them, its refusal to grant unrestricted access to UN weapons inspectors. The resolution offered Iraq its last chance to comply with its disarmament obligations. It failed to do so. On the 8th of March 2003, John Howard moved a motion in the House of Representatives condemning Iraq's refusal to abide by UN Security Council resolutions and endorsing the government's decision to commit ADF elements to the International Coalition of Military Forces. Opposition leader Simon Crean said that, and I quote, Labor opposes your commitment to war. We will argue against it and we will call for the troops to be returned, end of quote. On the 13th of March 2003, Prime Minister John Howard addressed the National Press Club and said in part, If the world fails to deal once and for all with the problem of Iraq and its possession of weapons of mass destruction, it will have given a green light to the further proliferation of these weapons and undo 30 years of hard international work designed to enforce conventions on chemical weapons and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty." End of quote. Australia committed a small yet highly effective military force of all three service arms to the coalition invasion of Iraq. Within three weeks of the invasion, coalition forces seized Baghdad and overthrew Hussein's corrupt and brutal dictatorship weapons of mass destruction were not found. The real struggle was about to begin. And for Australia, six years contribution to security, counterinsurgency and nation building. In terms of personal reflections and observations, I 
I just offer a number. I've reached the conclusion that peace is not a natural state of affairs, and I know that many of you will be thinking, why did it take you so long? It is something towards which we must constantly work, making sacrifices and compromises in the pursuit of a peaceful regional and world order. In fact, Graham Davison, in the Professor of History at Monash University, makes the observation in his book, The Uses and Abuses of History, that ethical and responsible citizenship requires a number of things, perhaps not only for us as individuals, but for nations. And that is to be imbued with the imaginative capacity to see the world through the eyes of other human beings. A visitor to the Australian War Memorial asked me last year why we don't tell Australians what the nation does to avoid war. Good question. A museum for both democracy and for Australian diplomacy could serve such a purpose. The RG Casey building, just on the other side of the lawns here, houses the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Its corridors, theatres and meeting rooms are adorned with photographs of Australian prime ministers, foreign ministers and diplomats at key moments in our nation's history prosecuting Australia's interests. These are often the stories of a nation working to avoid war and shape peace. They need to be told beyond those of us privileged enough to step in to the diplomatic world that is housed within the building. Giving Australians an insight into and understanding of what the nation's leaders and diplomats have done to maintain peace and prevent conflict is no less worthy a pursuit than that of telling our experience of war. But I'm also reminded every single day at the Australian War Memorial that there are in the end some truths by which we live that are worth fighting to defend. Proponents of the parliament making the decision for the nation going to war assume and frequently assert that a parliamentary decision is more likely to reflect public opinion. It is assumed that the executive is removed from public opinion, and as such, the momentous decision to go to war should be one made closer to the people who elect their representatives. It also assumes that the popular view is the correct one and should prevail, informed or otherwise. One of the most difficult and important tasks before a member of parliament is to know the difference between what is popular and what is right. Some parliamentarians regard themselves not as representatives in the mould of Edmund Burke, but as delegates. I well recall in the debate of the bill to overturn the Northern Territory's euthanasia legislation, the then member for Cowan, Richard Evans, told the House that he had found the issue very hard. So he had surveyed his electorate. As the majority supported euthanasia, he would vote in accordance with their opinion. The parliament, with some notable exceptions, is a reflection of the society from which its members come. Men and women come from all walks of life, bringing with them the experiences that have layered their lives, differing intellect, prejudices, interests and capacity to understand. Some wars enjoy broad popular support, at least at first. Others do not. These decisions are never taken lightly by those who make them but they are informed with the best intelligence, military, strategic and diplomatic advice that can be offered. Would the House of Representatives make the decision where the government has a majority? Would the Senate also vote? And what then of it having a different view from the House? By definition, a divided parliament means the opposition opposing involvement in a particular war in any case. If the key instruments of authority were vested in the parliament and one deeply divided, the impact on deploying defence personnel, enemy propaganda and sustaining morale for the operation could be dramatic. The truth of it is that when these decisions are made, very careful consideration is given to every aspect of the proposed operation by those in the executive of the government of the day. The Prime Minister, Defence and Foreign Ministers are integral, carefully weighing up the many issues. Where lays Australia's national interest? What are the likely consequences of involvement in this conflict? What are the geopolitical and geostrategic risks? 
What is the attitude of this proposed deployment of the international community and of Australia's allies? What will be the human and economic costs? What is our objective and how likely is that to be achieved and at what cost? What are the precedents and experiences of history upon which we can draw? What is the disposition of the members of the outer ministry and of members of the backbench? Will the opposition leader support this? Where will the Australian public line up and on this and how much information can safely be made available to them? The Prime Minister and key ministers know, along with their backbench, that they will have to explain and defend their decisions uh, extensively once they have been made. They know that parliamentary question time is likely to be dominated with probing to what will become increasingly difficult questions. They know that the media will relentlessly scrutinise, probe and question. And of course they also know that at some point there will be parents, widows, widowers, children whose questions will be the hardest to answer. If you were not clear in your own mind why lives were lost in a particular cause, it will never be clear in theirs. In the end, from my own experience, after all the advice from ASIO, DFAT, Defence Intelligence Organisation, Office of National Assessments, Australian Security Intelligence Service, Defence Chiefs and other agencies, it comes down to this. What is the right thing to do? I thought Afghanistan was the right thing to do. 3,000 civilians, as I said, had been murdered on September 11 in an attack on the US mainland. Australia activated the provisions of the ANZUS Alliance to do what needed to be done. A little over a year later, 88 Australians were amongst those who were murdered in Bali by three men who trained with Al Qaeda under the protection of the Taliban in Afghanistan. Beyond that, though, it is clear that our generation is facing a resurgent totalitarianism in the form of Islamic extremism a small group having hijacked the good name of Islam to build a violent political utopia. But the other reason is that it was the right thing to do. It would be delusional and irresponsible, as I think it would be now, to think that we should leave this to a handful of other countries. To do this would violate all this nation has stood for in its short history. In hindsight, though, we were disadvantaged going into a NATO-led war without having a relationship with NATO. But NATO suffered also because it didn't know how to effectively engage a non-NATO member turning up to fight with political will, military capability and financial commitment. As Australia's first ambassador to NATO, my job was to get us to the table, to ensure that not only were we shaping decisions, but they were also making decisions. The low point had been when NATO's ref refused to allow Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister in 2008 into the meeting to discuss Afghanistan at its leaders' summit, summit in Bucharest. At one NATO meeting prior to the Chicago 2012 Leaders' Summit, as Australia's ambassador, I said this to the 50 countries that were around the table. Um, I said very forcefully, Australia is the ninth largest overall military contributor. We have the third largest special forces contingent. We are one of the largest funders of the Afghan National Security Forces and of development assistance. We are fighting in the South and have sustained significant casualties. And yet you still don't get it. You are making decisions without involving us. When asked later that day by the NATO Secretary General's Office of my instructions from Canberra, I was able to say that I had been advised and I quote, keep sticking it into the bastards, <laughs> end of quote. With the negotiation and signing of NATO's first high-level political declaration with a non-NATO member by its Secretary General uh, and Australia's Prime Minister in 2012 here in Canberra, this will never happen again. Australia now enjoys enhanced partner status with NATO. The benefits are already being seen in the context of the events in Ukraine. Although I was not a member of the National Security Committee in 2003, I was a cabinet minister when faced with the decision to join the coalition of the willing, as it was described in Iraq. I supported it. I knew it was a momentous decision, and I was also aware that I was 
limited in my understanding of the complexities of the 7th century caliphate and how removing Saddam Hussein might play out both in Iraq and in the region. But for me, here was a man who had been responsible on average for over 70,000 deaths a year for 15 years, mainly by brutal torture, including through two wars. This was after an attack on the United States that had killed more people than had the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. The US was not prepared to wait for a second tragedy, possibly sponsored by a rogue nation state. We knew Saddam Hussein had WMD and had used them, but because of his refusal to cooperate with the United Nations weapons inspectors, we did not know if he still had them. Australia had both a Republican US president and a British Labor Prime Minister committed to removing Hussein, effectively asking of us, which side are you on? Based on what we knew at that time, I thought it was the right thing to do. Saddam Hussein, in hindsight, was not an immediate threat, but he was an inevitable one. The events that followed were as much responsible for the ensuing decade in Iraq as the removal itself, dismantling the Iraqi army, debathification of the public service and the use of US contractors to provide services were among a number of early and significant errors. I've found over the years in the many roles which, in which I have served that in the end you have to make your own decisions. In doing so you seek and listen to the advice of experts in the particular field in which you are working. But I've also learned something about experts from my leadership of the medical profession until now. They tend to see the world through a straw. In the end, you have to apply intellectual rigour to the process of exercising judgement in the very best interests of those whom you lead and whom you represent. During election campaigns, we often hear our political leaders seeking the office of Prime Minister ask the question, who do you trust? It will be specifically directed at a particular field of policy interest rates, security, health or education. But it is the most important question for every Australian to ask of him or herself before voting. Although candidates and parties have policies, election commitments and manifestos, in the end, we are choosing a person, a prime minister, to exercise judgment on our behalf and that of our nation over three years. It's not for the known that we choose a Prime Minister, but the unknown. The decision to go to war is the most important that any nation will ever make. It can't be one that can be held hostage to populism in any form. Looking back over our history, in my own view, I think all of our governments have made the right decision. It was right at the time, based on all of the information available to them, having regard for Australia's, Australia's geopolitical circumstances and best interests. It's equally clear that when regarded as being in the national interests, our governments have gone to considerable lengths to involve the parliament. In hindsight, it's very easy to contest a number of those decisions. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, of course, my kids have it. But I'm also confident that if the parliament had been fully responsible, fully responsible, for making these decisions over more than a century, we would be a different nation today, with a different view of itself and its place in the world. In the end, someone has to be held responsible for decisions. That should be the government and its prime minister of the day. Whatever the view of any one of us that we adopt for the decisions to go to war, to Bean's man lying out there at Posy Air in the low scrub of Gallipoli, who in his last moments has thought, well, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. I say, yes, we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nelson. We do have a few minutes for just one or two questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please come to the nearest microphone and I'll give you the call. Uh, yes, sir. 
Thank you very much for the speech. Um, I was wondering what you think are the best indicators for being able to trust a future Prime Minister. I remember one, someone once told me that they look at the relationship between a future Prime Minister and their wife and use that as a, that, that's all they looked at. And I thought that was quite interesting, you know, that's the most important relationship in their life and that should be a, a, some determinating factor, but it wasn't one I necessarily held. But I'd be interested to see if you have any thoughts on what you think are the best indicators for trusting a future PM. <laughs> when you find out, can you tell me? But, uh, uh, well, it's, it's like everything in life, you know, we, we, we all make judgments and I think there are subtle but powerful factors that influence our judgments about, about others. Uh, and in relation to a wife, I presume you're referring to what could be a husband or a partner in the case of former Prime Minister Gillard. But uh, I, I think one of the things that, that we, we've seen over, the, over our history is our Prime Ministers are generally people that have spent 15 to 20 years in public life. We've had an opportunity to get a, a picture of them. Um, it, it's, it's very hard to make judgments about people you've never met. In fact, one of the advice I give to young people is never pass an opinion on someone you haven't met. But it's very hard to make judgments of people that we see in glimpses of the media, whether television or radio or print or, and so on. Uh, but I think over a, a long period of time, we see them reacting to circumstances, some of which they anticipate and others that we, that we don't. We also see how they interact with other people whether uh, not just heads of state or, or you know, VIPs, shall I say, but how they interact with the everyday person, how they, uh, the respect that uh, perhaps the, and reverence that they're showing for other people. Uh, we, personally, I think the, the kind of things that, you know, I, we need leaders who have a, a minimum level of intellect. We need people that are clearly intelligent and as Australians, we want our prime ministers to be intelligent people but we don't want them to make us feel stupid in the process. Uh, we also like people that have a sense of humour, that take their job seriously, but not themselves. We like to see them making others feel a respect for, them, for, for, for themselves. We like to see them having uh, being the capacity to articulate a vision of who we are and where we want to go and why we want what the outcomes that we, for our nation. Uh, even if they're things that personally we may not, of which we might not uh, necessarily agree. We need to see people that are prepared to work very hard. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, the other thing that's important, I can only say this from one of my own experiences, is that, um, in fact, I'll tell you two things. Uh, I stood for pre-selection for the Liberal Party in the seat of Bradfield on Sydney's Upper North Shore in May 1995. It was character building. Uh, and at the end of my speech to the audience of some 200, one of the questions I got from one of the Liberal Party members was, Dr Nelson, if you are chosen as our candidate for Bradfield and you are elected, will you put the interests of the Liberal Party first or will you put the interests of Australia first? And I said, well, that's easy. I will put Australia's interests first every time. Uh, and it's a matter of record that I was uh, successful. The other... Um, the other experience I had, which I regard as a, an ex, a wonderful quality, the first name of those eight men that I mentioned was Private Jake Kovko, and you would, re, would recall that he died in circumstances that were unusual, shall I say. It, it is uh, base in uh, Baghdad as a part of the security detachment. And then uh, uh, we went through the dreadful business where, unfortunately, the incorrect body had been sent back to Australia. I had uh, made the decision to, as Defence Minister, when I looked at the family who were Australian battlers in the, in the um, traditional sense of it, uh, that they were at sale, I thought, well, I'll, I'll take the plane down and pick them all up and take them into Melbourne because their, their son, their husband's, their father's uh, body was coming into Melbourne just after midnight. And of course, as you now know, uh, just before I left Canberra, I received this phone call to say that the wrong body had been put on the plane. I won't tell you what went through my mind. Uh, so I said to the Chief of Army, I said, well, there's only one thing for it, you and I are getting on that plane and we're going down there. And even though I've had nothing to do with this directly, I'm gonna to have to tell them this. It was a, a very, very difficult conversation, shall I say, with Mrs Kovko, Jake Kovko's now widow. And I called John Howard. He was sound asleep here at the lodge. 
Uh, you can only imagine the stresses on a Prime Minister. I woke him up, I told him that Mrs Kovko wanted to speak to him, he took the call. I, I've heard some pretty rough language in my time, but uh, the one side of the conversation I got was very aggressive. When uh, Mrs Kovko had finished, uh, John Howard came back on the phone and he said, uh, Brendan, could I speak to you whilst you're away from the family? And I thought, oh, here we go. So I stepped down onto the tarmac at the raft base at Sale and he said, Brendan, that was the right thing to do. He said, you need to call me any time through the night, you do so. He said, this is really hard, but you're doing the right thing and I appreciate it and you have my support. Now, whatever you think, and within this room, everybody will have their own views about John Howard as Prime Minister. From my point of view, that's the kind of person, whatever side we might have them from, I want that kind of person who's in the lodge when a minister takes the call about those kinds of things. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid our time is up. Oh, it's got to be very quick, sir. What's your opinion for how long we will be obliged to pay the premium on our insurance with America? Well, look, if you, if you think about this, uh, I am now very privileged. I'm the director of the Australian War Memorial. There's not a day goes by in this country where we should not publicly or privately give thanks for American sacrifice in the Pacific from 1942. Britain let us down twice in, in, in the 20th century. After the fall of Singapore, we knew we couldn't rely on Britain anymore for our security, and we had to look across the Pacific. And then when Britain joined the common market in the early 70s, that was another, shall I say, kick in the guts. And the Americans lost over 200,000 in the Pacific, 103,000 dead, half the bodies never found. Uh, in my very strong view, the American presence in, in the Western Pacific uh, since the end of the Second World War has been a critically important part of the security and stability of the region and the bedrock for prosperity of the nations in the broader Asia Pacific. I know, for, for, I know for the average Australian could be forgiven for thinking, well, Australia always kind of does what America thinks it ought to do. I can only say to you, I have been part of very robust conversations with my former counterpart or counterparts. I've been party to conversations that have involved prime ministers and presidents. And uh, uh, what, whatever the, the, you, you may see uh, publicly, uh, I can assure you they're very healthy, healthy discussions uh, under the service, surface. Uh, as I, by the way, I do not regard, whilst it was certainly the case during the Cold War era, I don't regard as Australia and what Australia does as paying, uh, as it was regarded in the 60s, as paying an insurance premium in terms of its relationship with the United States. This alliance with the United, if, if we think about it, if you think about the nations in the world that are deeply committed to political, religious and economic freedoms, the coexistence of faith and reason, a free academic inquiry, a free press, Whatever its faults, which are many, the United States is arguably the champion of that, along with many of those nations in Europe, and I would also include our own within it. So there's one thing I think we need to be more concerned about than American uh, military adventurism, and that's uh, US isolationism. So uh, okay. anyway, I'll, I'll leave you on that note. So, Please thank thanks, you. Dr. Nelson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming.